a little surplus. Okay, recording it. Oh, disregard that, disregard that. Okay, yeah, Megan's taking care of it. Thank you. Uh, as you know, I'm, I'm uh, what you call uh, electronically uncomfortable. So now I can't advance it, Megan, what do I gotta do? Oh, we got rid of we got rid of the governor. Okay, uh, I was in uh, in vet school in 1964, and we had a book come out called Silent Spring, and uh, Rachel Carson, who was a marine biologist on the East Coast, discovered that DDT was making the eggshells of eagles. They, there was no eggshell to them. And it, she also did it on the woodcock. And she found traces back in DDT we had just about wiped our eagles out in the United States. And it was the first time we had a major side effect from corporate America. Um, in the 70s, late 60s and 70s and early 80s, the veterinary profession, we sat on the edge of our chairs waiting for what's the next new thing to come out. And we're all, we're like a bunch of guppies. We just jumped on it. Oh, we got the first, there were no hormones being used when I got out of vet school in 67, zero hormones. And then we had the hormones come out. We didn't realize these hormones in the animal are the same as the hormones in the hurt person. And so Theo Colburn, uh, two of her, uh, two of her uh, scientist friends, called Our Stolen Future. And that discovered, they discovered diethylstabestrol would cause female infertility. And if you were pregnant and you took diethylstabestrol so you didn't miscarry between the ninth and 13th week of pregnancy, your child could be born without a uterus or no ovaries or no cervix or only one horn to the uterus and you were infertile and you were called a DES baby. When hormones jumped from one generation to the next, boy, did that put a scare. And they were able to prove this, uh, Theo Coburn and her two cohorts. And that book came out oh late 60s. And so that kind of was a warning to us that, hey, we better proceed with caution. Then we got Earl Butts, Secretary of Agriculture. Now he came up with a whole different philosophy about efficiency and get big or get out. Let's farm fence row to fence row. And he was a huge proponent of vertical, vertical integration. The diversified farm is not efficient. You can't know enough about pigs, chickens and cows. So these new drugs and chemicals and everything are coming out weekly. And so we, we were just sitting on the edge of our chairs. So what happened? It totally integrated. Dairy set up on the bottom, broilers, uh, pigs. Broilers were one of the first ones to go. Uh, they became vertically integrated. Uh, uh, 60,000 birds laying eggs. Uh, they keep them around for 80 weeks. And, uh, and uh, the dairy operations, they went from uh, loose hay, which is hard to make, labor intensive. We got a chopper now. Uh, they invented the hay bind, so the sickle mower was gone. Um, and I, you just observed all these things. And so uh, this, is, this is modern America we're seeing right now. And, um, it's kind of scary because uh, it's gone into the packing plants and, and I'll do a little summary at, at, the, at, end, ended, uh, at the end, but uh, we uh, lost all our chickens um, first and our pigs, uh, I estimated that when I started about 70% of our little dairy farms had a few sows and they would butcher or they would sell them to a packing plant. Uh, most of them went to Dubuque, Iowa from here or over to Austin, Minnesota. Uh, but then the swine disappeared. And um, the young veterinarians coming out of vet school, if they wanna be a swine veterinarian, they have to do extensive education after graduation because it's so specialized now. Um, so, market world uh, world marketing became an issue and 
before we hardly ever exported anything. And the 80s was, was kind of a bad time. That's when we first started seeing when they expanded and the price of land went up and the price of commodities did not go up. They used to call it uh, par, uh, parity, you know, and uh, the price the farmer was receiving wasn't going up as much as the price of land and the expenses parts got expensive. And, and as they built more infrastructure, they had needed more maintenance and stuff. And so there were bankruptcies. I mean, I, when I moved to uh, uh, Arcadia, bankruptcies were unheard of in 67. And gosh, all of a sudden, uh, FSA, FHA, Farmers Home Administration in Whitehall was huge. And we had a kind of a real narrow valley, steep side hill area in our county that was not really good for agriculture because it was too much wetland and fields were big enough. And, uh, you had to have a two-story farm to get enough, and and then and the farmers just couldn't make it. So FS, FHA ended up owning a lot of those. And if you wanted to go in and say, I want a farm, they'd set you up. They'd say, okay, we got 30 cows. Here's money for 30 cows, and and uh, we'll give you the loan for this. And the land wasn't that expensive. And so a guy'd go in and sign his name up, and they never gave him any operating money. So your cow breeder, your feed mill, and your veterinarian who are self-employed and doing business, yeah, we'll send you a bill. And that, uh, we started seeing bankruptcies. And you could put a judgment on this guy in small claims, which I did. I was a senior member of a four-man practice. And the judgment did absolutely no good because this guy, uh, he was sold out by FSA, FHA, and a new body would appear. And it got to be where... I hated to go to these new farms because I just lost money on the last two guys who were there over the last four years. And who's the third guy going to be? And so we were left handling, holding a, a bag. And I went into FHA and I complained. I said, if you're going to set these guys up, you've got to have a, some a revolving money account uh, to pay open accounts. Uh, there wasn't, it, it was very discouraging. Uh, in fact, there was a movie called Country that came out. Uh, the, uh, the gal from northern Minnesota, Jessica Lang, starred in Country, and that was on a North Dakota farm, and it was showing what FHA did to this farm family, and it got a real black eye, and that forced FHA. They actually changed. That's where FSA came from, Farm Services, FSA. They changed the name because they had such a bad, bad rap. Um, then CRP came along to help the overproduction. That's where they took land out of production and uh, paid you so much an acre. Um, 88 was a drought year. 88 was a drought year. And it's kind of scary what we're going through right now in the US um, with this dry weather. I track the rainfall every year and I've done that for quite a few years. And we're really short on rainfall in Western Wisconsin. Um, we, uh, we could be headed for a drought and that would be, that would be troubled waters for us. Um, in the eighties, what else did we have? We had uh, probably the best marketing system I've ever seen. And that is A. O. Smith Harvester came out with the harvester. Uh, big $40,000 silo, bottom unloading. Uh, boy, you can store feed from the top. You don't have to have all these. Uh, we had cement silos first in the late 70s. It seemed like a cement silo went up in every valley every week. When we'd come back to the clinic, the four of us, they'd say, well, uh, John Kaboon has put up a silo. He did over here after the silos. Then it was the harvesters. And well, you need a small grain unit now. You got the big forage unit, and then well, you need a slurry store, and so, uh, and A.O. Smith, they went to Farm Credit Association (PCA), uh, if you call remember that production credit association in the 70s, and they got their money from the Federal Intermediate Credit Bank, which was one in St. Paul, and uh, and you were part; it was part of a co-op, and so he rode shotgun in the front seat with the A.O. Smith harvester. They had instant financing sitting right right over here. You know, he'll take care of you. And so, man, did we have a plethora of, uh, of harvesters go up. 
uh, did, little did they know that those motors were high maintenance. Uh, they were fossil fuel hogs. Uh, and so they increased with the, they increased the problem too. Um, in 1988, a new, new product arrived and that was Organic Valley. They were thinking outside the box in Vernon County at Viroqua. Uh, there were some people in the county that, and the farmers were getting really sick of the volatility of price of milk and of corn. I mean, if you went into a bank and borrowed money in the spring for your crop, you had no clue what you were gonna get for that crop, how much you would get or what the price would be because if there was a good crop, corn could drop a buck, buck and a half a bushel. And if you needed $3 a, a bushel to grow it and you got 250, you lost money. Um, and so it was very volatile. Milk was real volatile. Uh, and as the co-ops got bigger, um, the co-op sorta was more perpetuating the jobs of the upper echelon in there that it, it kind of felt like, oh, I just saw co-op after co-op went bankrupt. Uh, Midland co-op would go, well, they're, they're done. You know, in this co-op and guys would have equity in there. Well, what, uh, yeah, I didn't get any equity. Uh, they called and said, I don't, I had $22,000 in equity and I'll be lucky to get three. And, and so the co-ops kind of took it by the, by the, in the, in the chins too. Um, so you got to get bigger. So you, these 30 cow herds don't cut it. So then you went to 60, 70 cow herds. Uh, um, so these, these farmers got together and said, we need value added, value added. There was a bunch of them down at Viroqua and some guy said, you know, I don't think we should be putting all these antibiotics in the cows. Uh, let's not use antibiotics. Okay, so they wrote that down. Uh, these hormones, these hormones scare me. After they read Our Stolen Future, that kind of spread through uh, the countryside. Uh, we're, we're not gonna use hormones. And, and uh, I went on my first farm in 1988. Uh, west of Arcadia, probably my best farmer in my whole practice. And uh, my entry to a lot of farms because we had six children, my wife and I, uh, was uh, what's new? What's new, John? And he'd say, oh, we went to uh, Kabuna's wedding dance uh, in Wamandi and uh, boy, it was a good time. It was a good time. We had a good time. And so I got to this one farm and I got out of my pickup and I said, what's new? And this farmer looked at me and he said, uh, I kind of like what these guys down at Roque were talking about. He said, I think I'm going to go organic. Oh, I'm conventional Detloff. I've got my grip with all my tools. And he says, it's organic. And I heard him, but like my wife said, you heard me, but didn't listen. I didn't listen to him, but I heard him. It's July. He's got this beautiful cow registered cow. He was in the registered paper business and uh, big white tri-state breeding cow. Uh, she just had twins, huge placenta hanging out of her. And you know, sometimes how when they have twins, they kind of, whoa, where'd the body condition go? She had stepped on her right front teat and uh, she had a toxic mastitis, 106 temperature. And as I said earlier, to be a good veterinarian, you have to be a good observer. And I was, I was setting my grip down, I'm looking at this cow and I could feel her heartbeat. I could just feel her heartbeat. And when a cow is really sick with a high temperature and in trouble, uh, it just, you can, it reverberates and the heart speeds up. A heart should beat 60 times a minute. They should breathe 30 times a minute and the rumen should be moved twice a minute. So two times 30 is 60 is the normal. And I put my stethoscope on a rumen and nothing was moving. Her heart rate was a hundred. And when you get a heart rate of a hundred, it isn't going bing, 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 bing. It's going kathunka, 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 kathunka. And that's a red flag. Anytime you get a cow with a heart rate of over 100, a lot of them are gonna be dead in two days. 
and it is just this is major time. And so I gave the best asset a veterinarian has is to give every sick cow a complete and thorough physical. If she's got mastitis, you don't run in and look at the udder and say, okay, we can treat it. You no. Know. If she's got malignant lymphoma, you want to know about it. Or uh, if her lungs are bad, you want to know about it. So I would always give a complete and thorough physical. And then I would step back and I would tell him what I found. And I would tell him what my diagnosis or possible diagnosis was and what I was going to do and what I wanted him to do and expect. Uh, I looked at this cow and I stepped back and I said, we're going to throw the kitchen sink at this girl. She is in trouble. And uh, what are you going to give her? I said, I'm going to give her tetracycline in the vein. I'm going to throw in some genesin. Oh, oh, oh. he said, you can't use antibiotics. Oh, I'm going to give her dipyrone to lower her temperature. He said, you can't use that. That's illegal today. Jenison's illegal today. Uh, practically 85 to 90 percent of the stuff that I started out with in practice in 1967 is illegal or was deemed illegal. It just went through corn finical and then whole gamut. And what, so I looked, I said, what can I give this cow? And he said, you can give her some fluids and some energy. And I said, what about this placenta? This is July. That thing's going to go south really quick. I want to stick a couple tetracycline pills in there and get her going. Said, you can't do that. And I said, why don't you just look the other way and I'll just put two of them in and you won't know about it. And he said, you can't do that. I was, I had nothing to treat that cow with. I gave her a bottle of glucose, a bottle of calcium and drove away. He knew more about organic medicine than I did. He was using homeopathy. He was using numerous things that were on the fringe of veterinary medicine that you're not taught in school. And this guy listened to the old old people and his dad was conservative and they had brought these things on down, just like the Amish and the Mennonites today. Uh, they didn't have a hard transition, a lot of them, because they knew, they knew what Arnica did and that before I ever did. And so anyway, uh, I got a home and I told my wife, but then I had sold out of my practice and was practicing alone. I said, I don't think I like this organics. I said, I don't have anything to do. Uh, and being a German wife, she looked at me and she said, well, why don't you learn something? I didn't get any sympathy from her at all. So I did. I started reading. I read the book, The Scientific Validation of Aloe Vera. Aloe Vera does 15 things. Woo. Turns on the immune system. Gets rid of the cortisol of the stress from a high fever. It's just like, I need, I need aloe vera in the uterus of a cow. That would work beautiful. And so that started started my training on that, okay? So in the 90s then, uh, Organic Valley started. There were seven farmers that got a deal with a, with a little cheese plant and they brought in milk to make cheese and they sold it out of the trunks of their car. The first year they grossed $98,000, Organic Valley did. And now they're a $1.2 billion industry. And they were the ones that started to set up the organic standards. California had some a group there that came along and others came along. And so in about the year 2000, they said, we want all the organic standards to be the same. So the US Department of Agriculture said, okay, we will get together and they published the standards and they, they looked at Europe standards and they said, you can use all these antibiotics and drugs, you just triple withholding time. We didn't start there. Organic Valley and Horizon started with no antibiotics, no drugs, no synthesized molecules in the animal. There were a few that were deemed necessary that we had to keep like for putting animals to sleep for surgery and anesthetics and that. Uh, and when we looked at the regulations the USDA put out, uh, they were so watered down that they said, we don't want any part of this. Any Tom, Dick and Harry can be organic. So they said, okay, you tell us what you want. And they appointed a 15 member board, the US Department of Agriculture, uh, 
and you applied for this with 15 members from the organic world got on this board and said, this is what we're going to use. George Seaman, the president, uh, the head of the CEO of Organic Valley sat on that board uh, and a lot of prominent people that weren't scientists and PhDs in academia, uh, they were from the trenches set up the, the standards and in 2002, this was published. Now it can be modified. If you wanna bring something on, you have to make application and they review it. And so it is changing. The problem that's happened is that this 15 member board has become quite loaded with people from high, uh, um, I don't wanna say this, uh, corporate America has infiltrated the board. And that's why poultry can be locked up and never see grass or outside and can be organic. That rule, the grassroots people wanted poultry to have access to outdoors and grass. And with the corporate America influence politically, uh, we need to do some serious looking at who's on that board because it's gotten a little bit not in the grassroots favor. Um, your, uh, as you saw earlier, the slides of corporate America, the problem that we have is that the farmer doesn't own any pigs anymore. The meat packer owns them. Uh, same way with the chickens. So in 2000, William Elbrecht, plant pathologist from Missouri, he said, what should we do to the soil? How should the soil be balanced? And I put this statement up at every meeting I put on for training farmers. You have to learn how to grow a full stemmed high bricks highly mineralized grass or hay for the rumen. Now we have what's called the von Liebig replacement theory for soil amendments. That's what corporate America and all the co-ops uh, have been on. The pendulum is switching quite fast. Von Liebig says, if you take 2000 pounds of alfalfa off this field and there's 1% phosphorus in it, or let's take potassium, 1% potassium, 2,000 pounds. That means you need to put 200 pounds of potassium back that you just took out. What happens if potassium is too high already and you're short phosphorus? So this replacement isn't working. And what happened after World War II, potassium nitrate was gunpowder and you're companies with the munitions manufacturing world said, what are we going to do with this infrastructure? We just had a tremendous run with the war. Let's make potassium chloride. Potassium chloride makes grass green and tall, but it's hollow stemmed and it's loaded with potassium. When you get a grass that's high potassium, low calcium, that is a veterinarian's dream. You get utter edema, you get poor quality colostrum, uh, you don't have the nitrogen in it. Um, and so everybody started fertilizing in the 60s, 70s, 80s with potassium chloride. You do that long enough and you get cows with milk fever that won't get up and cows with a huge utter edema. So this Dr. William Elbrick in Missouri said, I wanna know what the ratio of calcium, magnesium, potassium, should be and what the pH should be and how do we get it there? And so he developed the Elbrecht system. The Elbrecht system is true chemistry of what that plant needs, whether it's a tree, an alfalfa or a yarrow plant or a ronia berry bush, it needs to have this balance. And so we have, the organic world has switched over completely and a lot of the homesteaders, and there's now big corn farmers that are addressing the Elbrecht system. And most of our country is, is short on calcium. Calcium happens to be an element with 22 electrons, which means it's got the most energy. And when you have calcium in abundance that come into a plant here, you will bring all of the other elements with a lesser charge into that plant here so they can absorb the other elements it needs. 
And so it's discovered that the first thing you talk about if you want to be successful in organic is that you better get your soil in line. And I happen to watch this whole thing progress. And the, the person that says, I ain't spending a nickel on nothing. I'm going to go organic and just let mother nature do it. They never stay very long because somatic cell gets them. Why does somatic cell get them? Because the organic people said early on, we want a better product and we want to have value added. The somatic cell count, when I started in 67, there was no somatic cell count. If you could get it through the strainer <laughs> and you fed the strainer pad to the cats, you sold it. Well, they set a limit. The USDA the, said, we don't want any milk, potable milk over a, a, a thousand somatic cell count per milliliter. And this is the normal sloughing of the cells. But if you get mastitis or a problem in the udder, your cell count goes up. Then they lowered it to 750. Anything over 750, you can't sell this potable milk and it's checked every day in every barn in America. Organic said, we are not gonna sell any milk over 400,000. And they looked at us, I looked at it and said, wow, you really are setting some standards. They did it. If you are pushing a cow, like CAFOs do, get every last drop of milk out, they're stressed and their cell counts will run higher. If you're feeding them grass and they're ambling along at 50, 55 pounds of milk, the first thing they do is their immune system cranks up. And when I had a client that was getting the record setting and that, he was a good account. And when he'd back off the grain, the corn silage and feed grass and hay, I lost 75% of his vet work. Started feeding whole milk. His calves didn't get sick anymore. It just was a head knocker for me that all of a sudden like, wow, I used to do a lot of DA surgeries on that farm. I used to sell him this, sell him that. And within three years, his cattle, and they'll live longer. It's nothing to see cattle in the organic herds that are 15, 13, 12 years old. Oh, you'll see that. So it's changed and your plain folks bought into this. Uh, there are a huge expanding group of farmers in America, if you don't realize it, Ohio, Indiana, now they're in Northern Maine, they're in Northern Minnesota, they go to where land is cheap. They've got the labor force and they don't have the overhead. They still use horses and that. But, uh, so uh, the Elbrecht system is something that has really taken off because it is so right. Um, presently, our human population is not as healthy as we were used to be. We've lost our work ethic in our younger generation. Um, it's just, and it's really getting evident with this, this COVID deal. We need workers. With the advent of the chemical glyphosate or Roundup, uh, one thing we learn in the Elbrecht system is you need biology. Biology is part of the carbon cycle. Biology breaks down. See what mother nature does with photosynthesis it, all the energy comes from the sun. And if you look at a cornfield or an alfalfa field, 95% of the biomass in that cornfield or hay field is, comes from the air through photosynthesis. There's, there's 70 some percent nitrogen, there's sulfur over here. And this is all circulating. It all doesn't come out of the soil. Some of your macro minerals like calcium, calcium, need so much energy that calcium is one mineral that photosynthesis cannot get out of the air. It has to come from the soil. That's why it's so important. And so photosynthesis with chlorophyll can combine, uh, uh, we're a carbon-based carbon -based world. Carbon is the only element on the elemental chart that can hook onto itself. There's 92 elements on this elemental chart and carbon can form a double bond carbon, 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 carbon. Mucopolysaccharides in aloe vera are 3,000 carbons long, 3,000 carbons. And so we need to hook a sulfur on. Oop, there's a sulfur. When photosynthesis hooks a sulfur onto this carbon chain, it's got energy. It's taking the sun's energy and it's putting in this bond and it's also putting frequency. What is frequency? Frequency is the electron 
spinning around a proton and a neutron, if they're positive, they go clockwise. If they're negative spin, they're counterclockwise, okay? So you got a molecule that's going this way and this way, and they combine, and that all sets up a frequency. Everything is about frequency, okay? So when you do this in a lab, when you make diethyl stabestrol or a aspirin in a lab that's made by chemist and not mother nature, there's no frequency. Get that? When you take aspirin from Bayer, it'll cause a stomach ulcer in a cow if you give them too many pills too long. It'll cause a stomach ulcer in a human because it doesn't have frequency. The aspirin, acetylsalicylic acid in willow bark will not cause a problem because it has a frequency instilled by photosynthesis from mother nature. It is so interesting. Anyway, glyphosate has killed all these microbes and these microbes are there to break down. When you got a corn stalk, you got great big, big, uh, oh, you got lignans and you got, uh, you got a whole list of different molecules carefully. Uh, or organically, and they have to be broken down to go back through a root hair in a plant or an intestinal villi. And that's where you have microbes in your gut. They break and enzymes that you secrete in your gut to break down a piece of protein. If you have a piece of protein from asparagus, it's probably 200 carbons long, and it can't go through your intestinal villi till the intestinal microbes break it down in the soil. Now, glyphosate kills everything in the soil. There's algae, there's fungi, there's yeast, there's bacteria, there's viruses, there's nematodes, there's amoebas, protozoa, and they're there all to break these things down to let the carbon cycle happen, to go into the root again. And so um, this dead soil does not have any glue in it from these microbes and it washes. We've had hard rains the last few years and, and these side hills that used to be perennial alfalfa, perennial pastures where the cows have left and they've gone to round up, uh, round up ready corn, no-till on a side hill. I'm seeing more erosion in Tremplo and Buffalo County than ever, has ever happened before. Has ever happened before. We are in an erosion uh, period of time, we're going to look back on this 50 years from now and say, what did we do to our soil? Um, our USDA and our political world is really getting controlled by corporate America. That we can see. Uh, uh, climate change, we can't do anything about it, but we're going to have to learn to live with that. And these GMOs, um, they are affecting farming. Uh, these GMOs, it, it, Mother Nature is so divine. Um, man's knowledge cannot uh, come to what Mother Nature is doing. Um, synthesized molecules are appear appearing in our food now all the time. Um, if we could go back to a paleo diet and eat only what Mother Nature has put together with photosynthesis, we would be a lot healthier society. We would just be a lot healthier society. They're finding in newborn babies in urban America, in the umbilical blood at birth, 14 different pesticides are appearing in their blood. And that's scary. Um, everything works synergistically. Um, population, in 1960, I graduated from high school with 180 million people. 2020, um, we probably aren't gonna have two or 350 million people reported because we're having a lot of people fall through the cracks. 80% um, of our population is five generations away from agriculture. Think about that. We have a whole population of really educated, smart people that don't have a clue about farming. They don't have a clue about where their food comes. Uh, it's, just, it's just amazing. Uh, Future positives. Our consumer is much more educated. Um, co the computer, uh, as complex as it's getting, 
but it, knowledge is, is at our fingertips. Uh, I'm electronically not very good, but I sure know how to Google. I sure know how to Google and uh, I'm doing it all the time. Uh, I collect old guns and if I see a gun, I Google it. If I see, I'm Googling all the time. It's just uh, so much knowledge out there. Um, and we have a population that's changing. Um, I, I spent 35 years in practice and, and pretty much was in an intellectual dormancy. And then when I went to work for Organic Valley, I traveled the US and the world uh, in the organic paradigm. And I met a lot of smart people. Organic Valley and the organic world tends to have people that are thinking outside the box and just uh, and, and great minds that are that are just they have no boundaries and they'll hypothesize and they'll read and they keep informed and and uh, we are growing a whole population of strong young females our males are being estrogenized by our synthesized molecules in our food we have a lot of molecules that are like estrogen mimickers, estrogen blockers. We don't have a testosterone laden society anymore. And these young girls today are focused. And I think all of you, if you look in your family, uh, 80 some percent of the people going on for PhDs are females. Uh, and these young females are focused. They know where they're headed. And I don't think they're going to be for sale. I think the good old boy in corporate America and in politics is going to come to a slow ending. And I think I see that being really positive. Uh, I'm, I'm not a feminist or a, whatever you call a malist, but I see, I just see this is observation again. I just, uh, some talk on observation. Um, we're really recognizing that this microbiology in our soil is improving, is very important. You're, your conventional farming world is also recognizing it the same way. And they're recognizing we need sulfur. Sulfur's, pro you don't get good protein without sulfur. And so sulfur is being added to our fertilizers and that's coming from the Elbrecht system. The little tricks that the Elbrecht system has picked up on and taught is being filtered out. Um, food density, uh, nobody knew what a refractometer was. It could measure the bricks. What is bricks? Bricks was a winemaker in France, Anton Bricks, that measured the sugar in his grapes. The higher the bricks, the sweeter the wine. And we take that in. If you go into a grocery store, you can squeeze the juice out of a grape or an orange or an apple. Uh, what's kind of interesting, the apples and plants, that fruit, fruit plants that normally are attacked by insects, when you get a plant, a corn stalk or, or anything like that, or a corn kernel over 12 bricks, insects will not feed on high bricks food plants because the alcohol or the sugar is so high that when it hits an insect's stomach, it turns to alcohol and formaldehyde and they just stop feeding or it kills them. So bricks has become uh, very common for a lot of farmers are measuring their bricks of their, of their whatever they're producing, especially in the vegetable and fruit world. Um, the Elbeck system, as I said, is growing very fast. Uh, and that is so right. Farmers markets and the CSAs are coming up all over the, by local, uh, patronized local. We don't, our production paradigm has gotten so big that uh, if you ever watch the Packer game, usually once a year, they'll have a, a little blurb on the sauerkraut factories in uh, Green Bay. And they talk about these factories run three weeks straight, four weeks straight, just making a sauerkraut. That machinery never shuts down for four weeks. That machinery gets hot and that can grow bacteria and pathogens in it if they just don't break the cycle in that. And the way we're producing mass producing our food is, is opening us up to some real tragedies uh, and some of these pathogenic bacteria we have. Um, so there's been a big, big influx of farmer's market uh, people. When I first came to Arcadia in 67, 
we would go to Anona and we would try to get as much food in that shopping cart as we could at the least amount of dollars. We never read labels. We just, oh, there's some cheap, get it, get it, you'll get to it. That's days gone. Food buying is now a relationship business. I really want to look at the guy where I'm buying my eggs. How do you, what do you do to your chickens? Are your chickens in a little metal cage or do they run around out in the wild? You know, and people want to know where and how their food is produced. And are you dehorning them when they're two year olds? You don't do that. I mean, so the eyes of corporate America or the eyes of the younger generation are upon agriculture and we're being scrutinized. And we were doing a lot of things that weren't really good uh, back then. It just was the way it was, grandpa did it and that. So um, the alternative and medical paradigms are increasing fast. Uh, you're seeing more and more uh, non-traditional treatments. There's been so much learned in the in the biological world, uh, uh, comfrey just blows me away of what comfrey does for healing bones. It will heal bones. Arnica, there's about 20 herbs that I just stand back and think, wow, I just can't believe what I'm seeing. And personal observation, folks, is the most reliable source of truth. I mean, that's how it's based. It's uh, uh, you don't have to show me the data. I practiced 31 years before I ever got a mummy out of a cow's uterus. It does not happen with hormones. It never happens until colophyllum, which is called blue, a plant called blue cohosh or squaw rut. Uh, 1492 when the pilgrims, these little squaws would have this leather packets around here and they had colophyllum, blue cohosh grows in the woods in the Appalachian mountains. And that is super loaded with estrogens. So they have a young, Indian maiden childbirth and she's having problems, they would give her that dried root, chew this, chew this and swallow the saliva. And you'd get a big estrogen purge in the bloodstream. And what does estrogen do in the bloodstream? Dilates the cervix and gives the uterus tone. What do you want with a placenta that's hanging in a cow after calving? You wanna keep the cervix open and give the uterus tone. Colophyllum, I could get 60% of the mummies out of a cow's uterus with colophyllum. I don't have to see the data. I just know it works. Um, the synthesized molecules that are appearing in our food, anything that's made in a lab does not have the frequency of life and we're eating too many of them. Um, when you have the whole, I sent off garlic, garlic tincture one time and I asked for an organic profile. My wife got a little irritated when we got the bill. It was like 400 bucks and there was this many, I mean, huge list of organic molecules that I'd never even heard of. Every one of those organic molecules is in there for a reason. Um, and they're doing something and we don't know what most of them are there for and what they're doing. Um, Thank, thank you, Megan. Um, we'll go down one more. I see the plain folks are gonna continue to produce more food in America. It's just happening. They, they are good soil stewards. They get it with the soils. They're fun to work with. When you tell them you really need calcium because of this and explain why it, they get it. Um, so I see that. Animal fat is back. Uh, the whole cholesterol scheme, we're on our own path in America with cholesterol medication. The rest of the world isn't very excited about cholesterol. They do not use the statins. Uh, you travel, I've traveled uh, uh, Germany, uh, uh, all over Australia, New Zealand. Uh, nobody's on statins in these other countries, um, but we are. And that was all started by a doctor by the name of Ansel Keys, did a research on 12 men that was non-repeatable. And the drug companies jumped on uh, the cholesterol. And there was a gal named Nina Tychos that came out with a book about five years ago called The Big Fat Surprise. And why do your Eskimos and your people in the Arctic that all they eat is animal fat, 
they have no heart problems. They don't have schizophrenia. Uh, they don't have the diabetes like we have. Uh, and so this, this read this book, The Big Fat Surprise, because it'll really uh, explain uh, lard is, lard, uh, I was raised on lard and uh, animal fat, uh, butter fat, uh, whole milk has come back. And so we're, we're learning some things that uh, um, have always been true. The other thing that I see happening is that these large CAFOs are absolutely fossil fuel hogs. They have so many fans running. They have so many motors moving stuff. Uh, they're huge. You drive by these big chicken houses and turkey houses and, and uh, the dairy operations, and there's just banks of fans, big fans. Um, and our grid is changing. We're seeing more and more voltage problems. Uh, I got educated by a couple of people that took me under their wing that were brilliant uh, quantum physicists and electricians and that. And this DC current is a huge issue. And as we build more grid and more windmills and more uh, electrical uh, cell towers, uh, the uh, electromagnetic fields that are floating through here, when electromagnetic field hits something that'll conduct electricity, it sets up a DC current. A metal hog building with a metal roof in the windmills in Iowa, that's like Auschwitz for these pigs. These pigs are on re-rotted concrete. Um, it's, we're gonna see more and more human problems from electricity from DC current than we have ever seen before. And I might get, I got arrows in my back for saying this, but it is so real. I have seen a lot of farms that left, there's some farms that should not have animals or people on. Um, it's, it's a whole new world. I've got a little section of my book. I won't go any further, but read that because it will scare you. Um, summary, summary, we'll leave time for questions here, but small dedicated groups have consistently changed the world. Think about that. Small dedicated groups that think out of the box or use common sense or use personal observation, they have consistently changed the world. And I think this organic movement started with a small few dedicated groups and it's, it's, um, it's growing. Um, in this group in, in Iowa, whether you're producing pork or aronia berries or whatever in Iowa and scattered around that are listening to me today, um, I really uh, want all of you to be disciples and, and uh, spread the word, spread the word. Uh, Voltaire, the French philosopher, uh, he said, what's right will prevail and uh, is so true. I finished a little early, Olga, uh, if you wanna come in uh, yes. with questions and that. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Paul, for this amazing presentation. Just incredible. I've taken so many notes down and I plan to check out the books that you've mentioned. Um, and what is your book title? I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, Acres produced my last book and it's called uh, Dr. Paul's, what is my book called? Dr. Paul's Guide to Raising Animals. Organic. organic. Dr. Paul's Guide to Raising Animals Organically. Uh, and that's produced by Acres, a uh, very good company to work with. Uh, just Google Acres, A-C-R-E-S yep. USA, yep. and ask for books. Wonderful, yes. So, I'm it's, a, it's, a long, it's a long book. It, uh, it's uh, 54 years of observation. Okay, yeah. Thank you for, for writing that book and for for this incredible presentation. Um, there are some questions that have come in. I want, I also have a question for you. Um, so as a, as a mother of two young kiddos, um, you know, what can I do to provide my kiddos the best health possible outside of obviously feeding them 
organic whenever possible and, and following you know the the um dirty dozen clean 15 from the environmental working group what other suggestions do you have do you believe in like organic uh vitamins and things of that nature do you have any suggestions as far as that's concerned yes i'll start prenatal is really important uh, get a doctor or um, Megan, this is probably a question for you, but Megan has a degree in Eastern Oriental Medicine, is going for a doctorate. She also has a master's in uh, Chinese herbs and she's an acupuncturist. So she's the human arena to it. But start with prenatal care. Uh, get, get somebody that knows that, uh, what's the disease the Amish get because of folic acid? Yeah, there's a there's a problem if the Amish don't get fulvic acid, their children are born uh, and they only live a couple a couple years at the most. So get prenatal care. Okay. Second thing that's most important is nurse your children. My wife nursed our children for eight, nine, ten months, and our kids just never got sick. <laughs> I don't know. We were blessed. Um, they needed a spanking once in a while or a little discipline, but that was, uh, and I, I didn't spank. I could do it with my eyes and my, uh, or else I'd say, Joan, take care of it. That was the best way out. But anyway, uh, and organic, absolutely eat organic. Nurse the child. Um, I'm not a big proponent of giving them some of these vaccines at birth, uh, like the, uh, um, I shouldn't go there but the one that's uh, herp, what is it? Hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is contacted by sexual contact or drugs. Now, where is a baby? And they want that the first week of life. Uh, get somebody in the alternative world that will use moderation in vaccinations. That's all I'll say. We are in a vaccination frenzy in human medicine and we are in a vaccination frenzy in livestock, veterinary medicine. And I've seen herds that have been vaccinated with everything known to man that are really sick. It just too much will overwhelm the immune system. Uh, proper diet, proper diet, keep your pH up to six, five. I drink apple cider vinegar every morning because that even though it has a pH below five, when it goes through the Krebs cycle, metabolic, the metabolic cycle, it raises your, your pH. Uh, so eat paleo diet or eat organic. We have so many, anything that ends in sides, what does a side do? Herbicide, pesticide, insecticide, it kills cells. The two worst sides are homicide and suicide. And so when you're putting a side out on anything, apples get sprayed 13 times for pests. There's, they get if you're gonna eat eat organic apples, eat potatoes, get just a deluge of things on them. Uh, I just can't say uh, uh, enough. Um, and explore the A2A2 milk syndrome because A2A2 milk is real. A lot of milk allergies are caused by, and I do talk about the A1, A2 milk in my book. I happen to, we distribute Dr. Paul's New, Ze New Zealand where the A2 world came out of the education. We learned it from New Zealand, uh, but the A2A1 is real. Um, and uh, so uh, look at, uh, don't do anything real out of the box or out of the um, weird, let's put it that way. But, um, there's so much out there that, uh, Megan, would you want to comment? Because she's more into the human arena than I sure. am. Sure, yes. Um, so I really think it's important to be their advocate. I mean, you as their mother know better than any doctor. And I've found, I also have two young boys. Um, so I've found really having support groups of other mothers that are like-minded extremely helpful because everybody's their own unique snowflake and health 
Um, in traditional Chinese medicine, which is what I practice, it's very individualized. So there's not one protocol, there's not one diet, there's not one cookie cutter or one book to read on wellness and health. Um, but really let your intuition be your guide as a mother and don't be afraid to make a stand. If there's something that you feel is right and know is right, uh, really go for it. And that's where I think having that network of support is so important. Um, and we do live in a time where it's so accessible for us. So there's amazing tools out there um, to really tap into and connect with people that really do have your best interest at heart. Um, and if anything, there'll be a sounding board for you on ideas or suggestions, so. Yeah, indeed. If I could add, yeah. add to that, Olga, um, intuition is real. My wife is very intuitive. And when she says, you know, I've learned to listen because so many, if the gut feeling, if you get a gut feeling, follow it, follow it and, and don't listen to what the naysayers say. So, yeah. and there is, there is a, in the organic community, in the, in the animal world, the organic farmers, they love to share. Yeah. In my book, I've got a whole list of things that I learned from the farmers that just happen. And, uh, the conventional world, if I get a treatment for mass state, I don't want you to know about it, you know, where the others say, hey, you won't believe it works. And so it's very sharing this world. Yeah. Okay. That's enough. I agree. That's fascinating. You're absolutely right. You know, it's a community of people that love to share their knowledge and spread their knowledge. So hopefully future generations can make a, a better impact and, and be right by our mother. Um, so one of the comments that came from Muriel Strand, uh, it was kind of at the beginning of your uh, presentation, um, Dr. Paul, she said the industrial revolution had two parts, mechanism and fossil fuel power. The potential of human powered mechanisms is widely underappreciated and underutilized. So that was kind of her comment on that. And I'm just looking through additional questions of both Wendy and uh, Beth had the question about the cow, the cow that you mentioned that you told us the story about the cow that had the placenta issues and that you weren't able to treat her with any uh, of the, the medicine. What happened to the cow? <laughs> Fortunately, the farmer knew more than I did okay. and he used homeopathy. Um, he had a very strong immune system in his barn because he fed a lot of good quality. He was on the Albrecht system before people even knew it. So he was producing this rich, highly mineralized, high bricks plant and his cattle, everything I treated there just got better so quick. And she had a strong immune system. She had all the elements stored in her stride and muscle and that. So he nursed her through a tender loving care and uh, used uh, apple cider vinegar for energy. Uh, he gave her quite a few homeopathy. Homeopathy pills, it's all frequency. And uh, she came along fine. She came along fine. And I would have I thrown the kitchen sink at her and got credit for it. But um, I, I kept, you know, I had my tongue in my cheek when this all started. I was a conventional vet, you know. And the worst thing I like to I'm hear. I'm making a dressing. I just need to. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I uh, had my tongue in my cheek when I first started, but boy, I mean, after I saw how things, per personal observations are most reliable source of truth. I just go back to that and don't be afraid to try something. Indeed, that's so very true. Such a great wisdom. It sounds simple, but it it's so more profound. Um, thank you for, for sharing that wisdom with us, Dr. Paul. James Franson wanted to say, um, thank you, Dr. Paul. Awesome job, great information. Wendy said, Dr. Paul, thank you for your presentation. What advice can you give to farmers who raise animals and food 
on small to mid scale to connect the urban to the rural folks? Are you charged with telling the food story? They should be disciples. And if they are small urban doing something, uh, share their ideas. I am assuming they're selling products off the farm like on a CSA or farmer's market. Um, but if they see something that works or if they're producing good product, don't be afraid to toot your own horn. Yeah, yeah. And I, I another thing that Wendy, that maybe you could do is ask for customer testimonials. People always like seeing customer testimonials on a website too. That's another way to toot your own horn in the sense. Um, and Ashley uh, says, Iowa needs to get um, na naturopathic doctor's license so that we can practice there to offer individualized natural medical care. Agreed. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, do you have a comment on that, Dr. Paul? That's a clinical question. I had bypass surgery because I didn't eat right in my earlier years and I get chelated so that I don't get full of, full of plaques again. And chelation is the best kept secret for heart problems. Everybody that has had a heart issue or who wants to prevent one should go through chelation, which is taking the heavy metals, but it also takes the plaques out of your arteries and Iowa has outlawed it. And I would go to a chelation clinic in La Crosse and it was full of Iowa people. And how politicians think they're knowledgeable in medicine is beyond me. Very interesting. Um, so how do you spell, how do you spell chelation, Dr. Paul? It's C-H-E or? C-H-E-L-A-T-I-O-N, chelation, Google chelation. Okay. okay, we'll check that out. Thank you. And then uh, Ben Caldwell said, thank you, Dr. Paul. Respect your work very much and love your book. All right, you guys, we have one more minute. If there's one final question here before we end our webinar with Dr. Paul, um, if there's no further questions, then we'll go ahead and wrap, wrap things up. Um, what I will do is I will follow up with everyone that attended with a brief survey. We use your responses to report back to our um, grantors. So your response is very much appreciated. Uh, if you could please fill out the survey. Um, in addition, I'll go ahead and um, post this webinar on our YouTube channel. If you feel uh, so, so inclined, uh, share it with your friends, share it with anyone and everyone that may benefit from learning about this information. And um, Dr. Paul, it was truly a delight. Uh, thank you for being here today. We are so very grateful for your time today and uh, for, your, for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with all of us. And I'm sure many more people will, will see this on our channel and so ha happy to spread your message and your, um, and your work through, to our community. So thanks again for being here today. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. If everybody learned one thing, that'll be a huge success. Indeed. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and hope you have a great day. And um, have a good day, everyone. Thank you.